A trio from a century ago bids a warm welcome to Preserving Ballard. From about a hundred years ago, three young women cheerfully invite us into Seattle's northwesterly neighborhood of Ballard. Their sanguine salutation seems germane given the area's geographic separation, the formidable length of its namesake 1917 bridge, and its storied early concentration of work-seeking Northern European immigrants who arrived by train. As the late longtime Ballard resident Maxine Shallow Tuck genially noted in an oral history interview, bus drivers used to say, you got your passports ready, we're going into Ballard, because it was a foreign country, it was Scandinavian. In fact, when the Ballard News Tribune produced a 304-page large format history book in 1988, the title reinforced that theme, Passport to Ballard. The latest Passport will be published this month by the all-volunteer Ballard Historical Society. Preserving Ballard is trimmer and slimmer at 128 pages, and as an Arcadia book, it favors visuals over text. But its narrative and nearly 200 images cover a wide swath including the life of the Shilshol branch of the Duwamish people and Ballard's 27-year stretch as an incorporated city before its 1907 annexation to Seattle, along with ample views of industries, businesses, residences, and churches. The book's cover features our then photo, clad in bloomers, less restrictive than heavy dresses, and promoted by women's rights activists. The jolly trio looks south while cavorting on Ballard's west flank railroad tracks, symbolizing the area's rapid initial growth. For non-native settlers, this part of the world was about resource extraction from the get-go, says Laura K. Cooper, who led production of the book. This was a great place for timber, that's what really built Ballard, and the fishing industry came along after that. So from the beginning, there was the need to move things around. The rail line, opening in 1891 and featuring a Ballard depot from 1914 to 1948, runs roughly perpendicular to the ship canal locks, built from 1912 to 1917, and borders the bridge-hugging Fisherman's Terminal, established in 1914. This formative infrastructure helps define Ballard to this day. The book complements an online innovation of the Historical Society, funded by Floor Culture, that lets visitors click a map to see photos and data linked to 60 Ballard residences and listen to complete decades-old audio interviews of those who have lived therein, some from Polish and other underrepresented nationalities. This parallels another project that tracked more than 2,200 Ballard buildings over 100 years old as of 2016. The overall aim, Cooper says, is as straightforward as a welcoming wave. There are a lot of cool things that have happened here over time, and we want people to know about them. In our then photo, the cover image of the new book, Preserving Ballard, three young women straddle a railroad track along Ballard's west flank in the late 19-teens or early 1920s. Two are Swedish sisters from the Peterson family, Rhoda, left, and Ethel, center. The third is believed to have been their friend. A younger sibling, Ted Peterson, became a state senator and during his retirement led a successful campaign to restore the Ballard Bell to its original position on Ballard Avenue. Today, Ballard Historical Society leaders replicate the pose near the old Ballard train depot on 37th Place Northwest. From left, Cass O'Callaghan, treasurer, Laura K. Cooper, trustee and preserving Ballard producer, 
and Mary Scheil, president. The book will launch at 5 p.m. April 19th at Secret Garden Books, 2214 Northwest Market Street, at 7 p.m. April 22nd at Sunset Hill Community Association, 3003 Northwest 66th Street, and at 4 p.m. April 24th at the National Nordic Museum, 2655 Northwest Market Street. For more information, visit BallardHistory.org.